Okay, hi everyone. Uh, my name is Vignesh and I have two short talks. The uh, first one is going to be on uh, embedded DSLs and why I think they're a good idea, not just for hardware design languages, but also for building additional DSLs on top of those um, that can target other features of hardware uh, design and verification. Uh, then the second talk is going to be more of an ideas talk. I just have a bunch of questions and uh, I'd love to discuss them with all of you. So let's get into it. So when we talk about hardware design languages, I think there's roughly three high-level implementation techniques we can use. So one is this like freestanding DSL approach. The other is like this custom compiler approach where you take an existing language and you develop a custom backend for it. Um, similar to this, there's also this like reflection-based AST analysis, which I'll talk about in a bit. And finally, there's the embedded DSL concept. So let's talk a bit about freestanding DSLs and what I mean by this. So this is a custom language that is specialized for hardware design. And examples include the commonly used ones like Verilog and VHDL. Uh, granted, they were initially designed as event-driven simulation languages, but now they're kind of more or less specialized for hardware design. You have other languages like PyRope or BlueSpec Verilog or Veril that are also examples of freestanding DSLs. So the advantage here is that you have full control over the syntax and also the compilation process. So here's an example of like a tag union specification in uh, BlueSpec Verilog. And what's really nice is you have very ergonomic syntax for describing these things and also doing pattern matching on these tag unions at the circuit runtime, um, thanks to the full control you have over the language. And here's another example. Um, here's like the system Verilog constrained random API. Uh, again, the nice thing here is you have very ergonomic declarative constrained random API and it enables you to like just describe what you want. You can use very nice uh, combinators like inside and you can uh, toss size on like a, a let on, on a list. You can you have special bit data types as well that are very easy to define. So freestanding DSLs are great from this perspective. Um, but as you keep writing more and more code in a freestanding DSL, eventually the need for some general purpose programming constructs becomes apparent. And this includes things like, oh, you have duplicated pieces of code, okay, now I want to turn those into, I want to just call a function multiple times. Uh, but now I want to like manipulate something in a data structure. Um, so now I need support for data structures. I need iteration support, I need to build a more complex type system, or I need to talk with the external library, so I need FFI. And then maybe I need a standard library, you know, so on and so forth. And so when you reach this point, like we did with Verilog, there's two directions you can go. One is to build a metaprogramming layer. And this is commonly what you see in industry. There's like a Perl script that generates a bunch of Verilog, and uh, this is not really that great for anyone. Um, and the other approach is also not that great, which is to take the DSL and augment it with even more features. So like slap on all kinds of OOP and uh, type system level stuff like we did with system Verilog. But at the end of the day, you get a language that's just crippled and cannot compete with a general purpose language. So I think in general, the freestanding DSL approach is not that viable. Um, the other approach here is this custom compiler approach where we take an existing language and its front end, and then we design a custom backend for it that targets hardware generation. So examples here include Clash, which is a custom Haskell backend that uh, generates hardware from Haskell code. You have System C HLS or C++ HLS, and you also have MyHDL, which kind of fits in this category, which um, basically does an analysis of a Python AST and then uses it as like a metaprogramming layer for generating Verilog. Uh, and the advantage here is that you can reuse an existing language and you have good understanding of how it works. And the other thing is you can directly simulate a circuit because the semantics uh, of the circuit that you generate are equivalent to the execution semantics of the backend um, that you're producing here. Um, but there's many disadvantages here, which is that there's large implementation burden, and you're oftentimes limited to a subset of the language, and also being able to control um, the exact hardware that is emitted may be very difficult, depending on the implementation approach. So all of this is to say that I think embedded DSLs are a great approach for building HDLs. And the way we do it here is we embed hardware primitives and operators in a general purpose language, and that can be Python, Scala, there's many different options here, Haskell. And things like Lava, Chisel, Pi Middle 3, Amaranth, these are all examples of embedded DSL-based HDLs. And the advantage is that you can leverage existing libraries, uh, build tools, IDEs, testing frameworks, and language features of the host language. But the disadvantages here are that we have various syntax limitations by virtue of the limitation of the host language. 
uh, the code generators now become kind of arbitrary. And so it can be difficult to analyze, let's say, to prove that some generator will always produce a circuit that satisfies some particular property. Um, and also preserving semantics is hard. As you go from very high level uh, description of your circuit, um, as you lower that until you get to a form of like structural hardware, um, you may lose a lot of the semantics that you had at the high level description. But with those disadvantages in mind, I do think that UDSLs are a really great way to design um, not just HDLs, but other things as well for hardware design and verification. So at a high level, how do they work? The EDSLs provide some algebraic data type and some APIs by which we can manipulate and construct them. Then we write a regular program in the host language, and when we run it, it constructs this description, which is an in-memory ADT instance, and an interpreter turns that description into some final output. And that could be a hardware IR, it could be stimulus, various different things. So for HDLs, the EDSL primitives are hardware components, and the interpreter turns this in-memory representation into something like fertile or circuit IR. So why are EDSLs great? I think HDLs implemented as EDSLs open the door for more EDSLs that target other aspects of hardware design and verification besides just writing RTL. And I think we should expand the horizons of EDSLs beyond RTL design into other complementary domains. And so here I'll present three small EDSLs that augment and use Chisel and Scala. So the first one here is this EDSL called SimCommand, which is a uh, DSL for expressing high-performance test benches in Scala. So let's talk a bit about test bench APIs in general purpose languages. So we have like Chisel test in Scala, and we have very famously a CocoaTB library in Python. And these are great because we love using general purpose languages for writing test benches, much better than system Verilog. And one of the big advantages of both of these is they have these like fork join primitives, which are kind of used ubiquitously when you write test benches. However, both of them suffer from a very slow fork join functionality. And so this is what we try to rectify. We shouldn't have to compromise on performance to be able to use a, a high level general purpose language for writing test benches. So what is SimCommand? It's a test bench API that's embedded in Scala. We use chisel test as the simulator interface. And it's a purely functional API. So the test bench description and the actual interpretation of it are split. So here's an example of like a sim command enqueuing uh, function. So here we just take some data t, and the t here is going to be some subtype of the chisel data type. And so this means that you know we're using chisel to describe that this is a hardware enqueuing function. And then we have the regular post peak API. We have very standard wait until, and you can see the syntax here basically describes like imperative sequence of steps that we want to take. Uh, but very notably here, the return type is a command unit, and this is basically a description of a bunch of test bench actions we want to run. It doesn't actually eagerly execute any of these actions. Um, and similarly, the API is extended to support fork and join, so you can take any command and put it inside a fork, and now you get basically a thread handle to something that has been forked. And you can later on join on that thread handle. And finally, once you've composed your entire test, maybe you have this like push and pop command, this is your top level, then you pass it to some run function, this is your interpreter, and this is what actually unwraps the boolean from the command and turns it into a boolean that you can work with and assert on. And so here we have separated the description and interpretation of a test bench. So under the hood, how does the interpreter work? So on every time step, we run each thread until we hit some yield point, which is a step join or return. We collect any new threads that are spawned in doing so, and then we repeat this until a fixed point is reached. And then ultimately we step the clock of the underlying simulator, and then we repeat this until the main thread ends. And um, the advantage of this approach is that uh, we have turned basically threads from being things that represent <coughs> operating system threads or JVM threads or green threads in a Python API uh, into basically just constructing and invoking closures. Um, under the hood, what's going on is um, this DSL involves like monadic composition, and uh, that means it's, it's very easy for the interpreter to basically pause this, the execution of a thread and resume it at a later point just by allocating and invoking the closure. So to summarize this EDSL, it supports the core ADT type as a command R, which describes a test bench operation that terminates with a value type R. We lever leverage chisel for these RTL IO data types and for constraining the types of various functions. We leverage Scala's for comprehension syntax for monadic composition of commands. This is similar to like do notation in Haskell or uh, bind syntax in OCaml. And we get an API that's like 10 to 20 X faster than CocoTB and chisel test and supports all the same fundamental behaviors. So 
This was in command. I talk about two more DSLs now. So here's another DSL for imperative and declarative uh, parametric stimulus generation. So I want to talk a bit about like what the point of like this API would be, what makes it useful. We uh, there's two types of like stimulus generators out there. There's like an imperative generator similar to like the gen monad from QuickCheck. And then there's like declarative constraint solvers. This is similar to like system bear logs, constrained random support. And here we're proposing a hybrid API that can mix both of these generator types and leverages Chisel for hardware data types and also as a constraint language. So how does this work? Um, here's an example of like, okay, we're generating an integer in a particular range. And here, this is a Scala level integer. And here we're generating a sequence um, basically that, that has an average length of 10, and each literal in the sequence can be a value from 1 to 100. Um, and again, well, this is just a pure Scala level generation of a sequence of integers. And again, note here that we're using Scala's four comprehensions for monadic composition. So now moving past just generating Scala level data types, you can also generate chisel data types. So you can have a gen of uint. This is a fixed width, like hardware, uh, unsigned integer in the same range. And then you can also have, let's say, a chisel bundle, which is nothing more than like a hardware struct. It can have various fields with like fixed diff widths. You can have uh, enumerations. And similarly, you can also say, I want the generator of this data type. Now, we can also leverage chisel for constraints. So I define the same data type as I did uh, in the previous slide. But now I want to constrain uh, generation of that uh, memtx such that I want the memtx.off to be a right, and then I want the uh, bottom two bits of the address to be equal to zero. And you'll notice that what I have in this closure is just a chisel circuit. And in fact, it can be any arbitrary chisel circuit. You can instantiate modules in here. You can instantiate, uh, use anything from existing chisel libraries. You can instantiate whatever you want, as long as it's combinational logic. And this will work. Since chisel is an EDSL, we can leverage it to create other hardware DSLs. And that's the point of this API. So what can we use this for? Well, one example is this uh, idea of parametric fuzzing. So we have a generator, and you can have two different interpretation modes, one in which we use a Scala-based PRNG, and the other one in which we use a parametric byte stream, which is just a sequence of bytes that drive this, drives the generation. Um, notably, what we're trying to work on is like trying to unify both imperative and decla declarative constraint generators and be able to parametrically, parametrically control both of them. Um, so right now, that's very simple for imperative generators, but is much more tricky for declarative ones. Um, and eventually, we'll use this in like a parametric closing loop. And uh, the nice thing about our API is we can actually mark each byte with how it's used in the randomization process. And therefore, that information can be fed back to the mutator so it can more intelligently decide which bytes in the byte stream to mutate to reach some target stimulus uh, uh, metric in RTL simulation. Um, so this EDSL. The core data type is a gen A, which describes a generator of values of type A. We leverage chisel for data types and as a constraint language, and we leverage Scala's four comprehension syntax for monadic composition of these generators. And you'll see the same theme also in the third EDSL, which is chisel recipes. This is a cycle level imperative control flow EDSL. So control flow logic is something we all write. Like normally we manually convert like imperative control flow down to some explicit FSM representation. This process is very repetitive, mechanical, and error prone. And we can design an EDSL that can be used to directly express like cycle level control flow and an interpreter to turn it into RTL. So we have an EDSL composed of like four basic primitives, and there's a few more in addition to this. We advance a cycle, perform assignments like combinationally. We can have like grouping constructs like this while loop, and we can have like sub recipe conditional execution. And then because these are just defined as like regular data types in Scala, you can write combinators on them. So you can have additional functions that take recipes and return new recipes, just like all the other DSLs I presented. So here's an example. If I want to read uh, a memory from an Axie Lite port, I can describe it in this fashion. Notice I haven't specified any state or uh, things, uh, like basically logic to transition between these states. I just specified what I want to do is an imperative sequence of steps. And then I just compile it. I want to turn that into a RTL circuit. So another cool thing is we can leverage Chisel and Scala for debug features. So Scala macros can be used to insert like source line instrumentation into the EDSL primitives. And Chisel has like printf and naming APIs to in inject source info into the RTL. 
And so you can actually get waveforms like this where we actually can see the behavior of every line of that uh, recipe that I wrote annotated with the line number of the Scala source it came from, as well as the Godun signals indicating when that's active. So the implementation is very simple. Like each of these primitives is just a Godun circuit. And there is opportunity to use another lightweight HLSIR like Halux to produce optimized FSMs in the future. Um, so this EDSL, the core ADT type is a recipe. We leverage Sysl for RTL design and generation, and we leverage the implicits for source instrumentation and the front-end API. Um, I want to make a few quick notes on host languages. So like, why do I think Scala is a good host language? Uh, it has a lot of features that make this process very easy of writing new EDSLs. We have algebraic data types. We have flexible and extensible syntax that's also familiar to C developers. We have like monadic composition sugar, which is useful for many of these EDSLs. Direct style alternatives are also very nice, like algebraic effect systems. Um, Scala has a strong macro system, and that's useful. And lastly, it has very good IDE support. Um, so Scala theory is quite good as a host language. And to conclude this talk, HDLs implemented as EDSLs are an extensible foundation for other EDSLs. And there's many areas of hardware design and verification that would be served well with specialized EDSLs. And the question I have for everyone is, what new EDSLs should we work on that can leverage existing HDLs also implemented as EDSLs? OK, um, I can just move on to the next one. <laughs>